Well, now we're going we're gonna to dive back in to the sermon. And remember, again, what I said this morning, we're, we're looking at really who God has called us to be as the church, really what is the mission of the church. Um, and just as a refresher, the church is made up of followers of Jesus, uh, the men and women of God, people he has called and set apart. But think about what that means. If, if you're a follower of Jesus, when, when he saved you, um, he didn't just immediately take you to heaven, right? Uh, you're, you're still here. And in fact, Jesus, when he prayed the night before, uh, the night before his crucifixion in his high priestly prayer, John 17, I believe, he, he prayed, and one of the things he prayed was he said, Lord, um, he said, I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. Now, I don't know about you, but, but there are times that I wish he'd prayed differently there. I mean, this world is, is hard, and, and we endure suffering and, and pain, and there's times where I wish he would have just zapped me up out of here, right, immediately. But that's not what he did. We're not of the world, but we are in it, and, and that's by God's design. So, so what is that design? That's what we want to try and un unpack this morning. And throughout history, uh, the church has pursued, I think, radically different answers to that question. And, and the metaphors that Jesus uses in the passage we're going to look at today in just a moment, um, I think it makes it clear uh, that he understands the state of the world, that the, the world is in decay and in, in darkness. Um, you really wouldn't have to read the Bible to see that, just a few minutes with the news, right? And I think we all agree that, that there's problems in our, in our world. The world is full of decay and darkness. And as the church has observed this brokenness throughout history, again, they've sort of fallen into a couple of camps to address that. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the camps I would say is, is I'll just I'll, I'll call that separation. And churches who have, have sort of gone into that camp see the world as bad and evil and have tried to remove themselves from it. We don't want to be contaminated by the things in the world, so we're just gonna we're gonna separate from it. And what happens in, in that camp is that they end up just kind of sort of developing their own culture outside of the world. They're shielding themselves from it. And in fact, what usually happens is they end up creating their own rules and their own requirements for acceptance into the group. So that's one way the church has responded throughout, throughout time. On the opposite extreme is what I would call um, assimilation. And it's almost uh, this thinking that like, uh, if you can't beat them, join them, right? We're, we're just going to try and fit in. And what happens uh, over time is that you do just begin to blend in. You allow the culture to sort of shape you and societal expectations become the norm and, and God's truth gets diluted. And eventually you, you look no different than the rest of the world. But I think our passage today describes a, a third way. It's not separation. It's not uh, assimilation. It's, it's incarnation. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. And that word, if you're unfamiliar with it, it simply means to enter in by by taking on flesh. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he left heaven. He, he became a man and he entered into a specific time and a specific context with a specific group of people. And he entered in to bring the truth of the gospel with his life and his teaching. And you see, I think that's what Jesus calls us to do and to be. Not, not to be God, that's not what I'm, what I'm saying, but to be present with our words and with our deeds in, the, in a specific time in a specific context with a specific group of people. So what does it look like to be this kind of church? And I think our passage today is going to help us explain it. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 5, that's where we're going to be today. If you're using one of those Bibles in the seats around you, it's on page 810. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible or know somebody that needs one, please take one as our gift uh, to you today. But Matthew 5, uh, we're going to read verses 13 to 16. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now, the context for this passage is is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's his longest teaching, his longest sermon. It's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Um, and it's given to his disciples, but it's given to his disciples in the midst of, of a crowd. And so in one sense, it's kind of a, a unique sermon. It's for his followers, 
but he sort of expects everyone in the crowd, everyone who's listening, even if they aren't yet his followers, to be challenged and, and maybe even be invited in to the things he says. And so this sermon has sort of a, a dual purpose. It's intended for his followers, um, but it also has a broader audience than his followers. And that's kind of like a sermon on Sunday morning, right? I mean, when I'm preaching, I'm hoping that, that there's something for you who are followers of Jesus. But I'm also hoping wherever you are today uh, that you will get something that you'll just be reminded that Jesus is always inviting you in. He always wants you to, to ask questions, to wrestle with the claims that he's making. This is a safe place to do that. And so my hope today is that this sermon about, about a sermon 2,000 years ago um, will both challenge and encourage you, all right? So let me just pray to that end before we start. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word, for its truth, and thank you for... Uh, these words of Jesus that we're going to look at today, these declarations of us as his people. And Lord, I would pray, whether we've heard this hundreds of times before, read the passage, heard sermons, or maybe we're hearing it for the first time, wherever we are today, Lord, would you speak? I believe you have something for every one of us here today, and I don't, I don't want us to miss it. So don't, Lord, don't allow that to happen. I pray your spirit would move. Don't let me get in the way of what you want to do here. Speak to your people. Teach us now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this, this sermon that he gives, again, we're not going to talk about it at length, but, but the Sermon on the Mount, he talks a lot about the kingdom of God. And, and the kingdom of God in the sermon, he, he, there's a paradox in there. One of the paradoxes of the kingdom is that the followers of Jesus, who are the church, are no different than anyone else, Okay? They're no different. Everyone has sinned and falls short. Everyone is in desperate need of Jesus. But while we're all the same, followers of Jesus are also distinctly different because we've recognized our need for Jesus. Okay, so, so like I said, followers of Jesus, we're no different while being clearly distinct. That's, that's the paradox. And maybe if you're not tracking with me yet, one of the things we say around here often is that there's, there's level ground at the foot of the cross, and that should be comforting to know that we all come to Jesus in the same way. We're all the same. Uh, there, there's a phrase that's been used that we're just, we're just a beggar trying to lead other beggars and show them where to find bread. But here's the paradox. Every follower of Jesus is radically different. See, because we have found the bread of life, because of Jesus, the way we, the way we celebrate is different, the way we suffer is different. Because God's people understand that while the world is broken, He is perfect, and one day He's made a promise that He's going to make all things new. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a, a disciple, it's because God has saved you. His Spirit resides in you. You are united with Christ, and that's what makes you radically different from the world. But this is where it gets difficult. Because I think Jesus is telling us what at least at times, we don't really want to be. And that's different, right? I mean, Pastor Curtis just said this last week, that, that if we are a follower of Jesus, we're, we're a little bit different. The world's going to think that we're, we're odd. Whether we like it or not, that's just true. The world is going to see us as differently. And frankly, Jesus says we are different. We should be different. I think what he's telling us here is there, we're going to need to stand out from the crowd. What he says essentially is that he, he says, you're like this, and the world is like this. And the you in the passage is, is plural, so he's talking about the church, he's talking about us. The church is like this, and the world is like this, okay? So what does he say? He says, you're salt, and you're light. Those are two statements of, of fact, he doesn't say you should be salt and you should be light. He says you are salt and you are light. They're statements of fact. It's just the nature of things. And here's what I love about, about what he says there. And this is what makes Christianity so unique because Christianity always talks about identity before behavior. And I love that. You see, before Jesus tells them to do anything, he reminds them of who they are. They're salt and they're light. 
You see, this happens all throughout the Bible. If you go back to the very beginning, when God called his people, when he first chose Abraham, I mean, there wasn't anything special about Abraham. The first Jew was actually a Gentile. Do you know that? He was sinful. God, God called him to be his own. He made him the father of his people. And then, and then he called him to do something. It's the same way with Moses and the people of Israel. They're slaves in, in Egypt, right? God rescues them from slavery. He, he redeems them out of slavery. And then he gives them the Ten Commandments and tells them what to do. See, Christianity is unlike every other religion in the world. Because every other religion in the world gives you a checklist. They tell you, here's the things you have to do. Do all these things. Don't do these things. And then maybe God will accept you. Christianity is the opposite of that. Christianity always saves first and then calls us to follow him. So I love the way Jesus does that. He first tells them what's true of them. And he's also saying what's true of us. He says, you are salt and you are light. And again, I've said this before, but in doing so, he's also making a statement about the world, right? Because essentially what he's saying is that the world is in need of salt and the world is in need of light. He's saying it's decaying and it's dark. And again, I think we would all agree with that assessment. And I don't know about you, but when I think about it in those terms, it, it begins to feel a little bit overwhelming, when I start to think about the state of the world, when I think about the, the enormity of the, the needs that are out there, I start to wonder, what, what could I possibly do that would make a difference? I mean, I start to ask, could our church really make a difference? Again, I think it might be good for us here just to pause and, and get some context. Just remember who Jesus is talking to when he gives this sermon. He's not talking to the United Nations here. He's not talking to a collection of superpowers, important, powerful political leaders or, or CEOs, not Congress, not even a city hall meeting. He's just talking to a crowd on a hillside in a tiny spot of land called Palestine. Common people, no high ambitions, no power. In fact, they're under occupation, they're, they're oppressed. They couldn't make their own laws, they couldn't plan their own futures, they couldn't determine their own destinies. And yet Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. What he's saying is, you can make a difference in this culture. It's amazing to think about. I mean, I read an article this week, uh, a guy was just telling a story about it. He remembered he was at a county fair uh, one day, and he was, he was walking through sort of the midway at the county fair, and he was seeing all the booths on both sides, and, and he came upon this tiny little girl who had this big fluff of cotton candy in her hand. It was like as big as she was. And, and they made eye contact and she smiled. And so, so he smiled back and he asked her a question. He said, how can a little girl like you eat all that cotton candy? And she said, well, she said, I'm a whole lot bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. <laughs> and you see, I think that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Why? Because you're great power, because you're really smart, because you have all these gifts. That's not what he's saying. He says, it's because you belong to me. I mean, on the outside, we may be nothing special. But on the inside, as, as followers of, of Jesus, we're as big as the kingdom and the power and the glory of God. I mean, Paul said something similar in talking about the church in 1 Corinthians. Listen to his words. He said, For consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Church, God can use us. He, he can use us to make a difference in a, in a decaying and a dark world. And so I want us to look at these two analogies Jesus uses and see what they might be saying to us. First, he says that you are the salt of the earth. Now, salt in our day has, has sort of gotten a bad rap. Doctors tell us it's not good for our heart, right? It causes high blood pressure. We should stay away from it. 
But salt was very important. It had great value in the ancient world. Roman soldiers were actually, uh, their wages, they were paid in salt. Um, have you ever heard that phrase that a worker is worth their salt? See, that's where it comes from. Salt, salt was very valuable. And so it was used in a variety of ways. It was used as, as a seasoning to give flavor. So certainly there's a, uh, an application for us there. Our lives should season, add flavor to the things we come in contact with. Now, salt was used as a fertilizer. It was believed that, that if you sprinkled salt on the ground, it would help the roots develop so they could uh, absorb more, more water. And so there's a sense in which the church uh, is like fertilizer in a field. We ought, to, we ought to make the field, the places where we are, more receptive to the seed of the gospel. Our, our presence in the world should increase uh, the openness and the sensitivity of people to the gospel. But salt was primarily used as a, as a preservative. That was its primary use in those days. And, and I realize this doesn't make as much sense to us um, because we don't usually use salt in this way. Um, because thankfully we have this invention called the refrigerator, right? We don't need it like that. But in those days, salt was essential to keep meat from decaying. So again, just think about what Jesus is saying here. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And so what he's saying is this world is like the meat. It is decaying. But as salt, you're called to be a part of preserving it. So how does that happen? How, how does that work? Again, it, does, it, it seems to make sense. Salt is not much good in the shaker. Je Jesus didn't say you are the salt of the church. He said you're the salt of the earth. So we have to get outside the walls of our shaker. We have to get outside the walls of this church building and into the world. But it's even more than that because salt just, just sprinkled about, it still doesn't have the same effect. If salt's going to prevent decay, it has to actually be rubbed into the meat. It has to come into contact with it. And what Jesus is saying is to be salt is to be in contact with the people and the places where God has put you. And again, the only way we do that is, is by getting outside the walls of this church. By participating in the community and, and entering into relationships with people, again, outside these walls. And the truth is, that's why it, it's sort of intentional as a church. We don't have a lot of programs as a church. It's intentional because we don't want you coming here for everything. We want you to be out there where people who need Jesus are. That's why we publish on our website, we publish the activities, the things that are happening in Manchester and Baldwin right here where our church is because we want our people out there in the community, in contact with people sprinkled all around our city and all around the world. We need to be scattered in every dimension of society. That's business and, and art and school and music and Hollywood and politics everywhere. The church needs to be scattered, preserving promoting justice, adding beauty. The world needs to be salted. And God has called us as the church to, to do that, to be the salt, to add the seasoning and the, the flavor, but also to be the presence that actually prevents decay. That's who he's called us to be. So how, how do we do that? We, we don't have a lot of time. I'll just, I'll just say one, maybe one way. I would say that's with humility. Humility. See, too much salt at one time sort of can ruin a dish, right? If, you're, if you ever had a shaker and the lid comes off and it all dumps in, it can sort of ruin the meal. And Paul says as much, actually, in Colossians 4, he says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. He goes on to say, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. That's how we're to live. So I'll, just, I'll give you a little homework, and it'll only take a couple minutes, I promise, this week. But just go back and read the first 12 verses of Matthew 5. The beginning of his sermon, uh, uh, Christians throughout ages, we've called those the, the Beatitudes when Jesus starts there. But he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. I mean, that's how we be salt in a decaying world. When we live like that, we will actually help preserve a decaying world. And remember, salt is only effective when it comes in contact with the broken parts of the world. And so when I say be in contact, I mean actually entering into the lives of people who are outside the church, people who are very different than us, people who, who think differently than us, people who act differently than us, people who vote differently than us, people who spend their money differently than us. We need to engage those people. We need to engage them humbly, Seek to listen and understand. And then when God presents an opportunity, we're to, 
bring flavor to their life, to help preserve their life. I mean, Jesus spent a lot of time getting to know the people and the context where God put him. I heard a story just this week from someone here in our church, and they've been getting to know some new neighbors. They've been trying to be salt, just getting to know them, spending time with them. They've had them in their home, and and unfortunately, just this past week, this, this neighbor encountered sort of a crisis. And they reached out to this couple in our church and said, we have some questions. They said, we want to talk about heaven. And this couple had the opportunity to, to not only talk about heaven, but to share the gospel with them. Because they had been salt in their lives. I mean, who knows what will happen, but it's possible when we are being salt and light. And so here's the question I want you to just think about um, before we move on. Do you have anyone in your life? Are you in contact with anyone who thinks differently than you, who, who acts differently than you, who votes differently than you, who spends their money differently than you? And are you, are you humbly in contact with them? I mean, would they be comfortable coming to you so that then you could give a reason for the hope that's within you? Well, Jesus used another analogy. Uh, again, I think we understand it, but probably it had more impact in his day as well. He, he says that we are the light of the world. Um, the people that Jesus was talking to in that day, they, I mean, they couldn't fathom electricity. That would make no, no sense to them. They understood what darkness was all about. And I think for us, it's a little hard to comprehend because we are rarely in, in complete darkness. We don't experience that. Very often, we have the lights of, of our houses or, or the cities on the horizon or even all of our screens put off light, so we just always have light in our midst. But, but have you ever been somewhere where you've just sort of been in, in pitch darkness? Have you ever been in a place like that? I, I've shared this story before, but I remember a night in Haiti when uh, we were in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, and our bus stalled out in the middle of a river. We didn't speak the language, we didn't know where we were, and it was pitch dark. It can be scary. And see, the darkness just added another component. Darkness can be disorienting, it can be, it can be scary. You see, light helps us see in those situations. And so Jesus goes on to say, he talks about what kind of light we are. He says we're like a, a lamp, and I think that's an important uh, illustration for us to think about because a lamp, a lamp contains light. And you see, that's true of us. Because Jesus has said, he is the light of the world. And you see, we only become the light of the world when we are lit by him. And I think what Jesus is saying in this text is that, that, that you're the light of the world because I'm the light of the world. I mean, John chapter 1 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And Jesus goes on to say in John 8, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He calls himself the light. He says he is the, the truth that radiates to the world. And so to be the light of the world means to be a people who, who proclaim that hope and that glory to those around us. And so if you've put your hope and your trust in Jesus, I mean, here, just a quick, here, here's what we believe. We believe that we are we're dead in our transgressions. Because of our sin, we were, we were dead. We have nothing to offer God, nowhere to go. We're, we're condemned to hell. And yet because of Jesus, because of this perfect life he lived in our place, because of the, the, the sacrificial death he died in our place on the cross, and then when he rose from the dead, he conquered sin and death and hell. He saved us from condemnation to a life and eternity with him. And we're told this is a free gift. It's, it's grace. It's all of God. We don't have to do anything to earn his favor. But instead, because of Jesus, the debt's been paid. And that's good news. And, and yet, if that weren't good enough, he goes on. He says, not only say, have I saved you from something, I, I've saved you to something. You once were dead, but now I've made you alive. I've given you a new name and a new identity and a new purpose. And I'm inviting you to be a part of this work I'm doing in the world. Church, that is good news. And here's why it's important. You see, because the gospel allows us to really be realistic about the darkness of our own hearts while still being able to point people and offer them light. Again, what I said earlier, darkness can be really disorienting. We know something's wrong with us, and we're just not sure why. 
And what the gospel allows us to do is to name what's wrong with us while pointing people to something better. And let me just be clear about this. When I, when I talk about us shining our light, um, proclaiming the glories of Jesus, let me just add this disclaimer. I'm not talking about doing that on social media, okay? I mean, I know sometimes I just fear that Christians think that we're shining our light when we argue with people on Facebook. I mean, do you really think that's going to convince anyone? I have yet to meet the person who comes to me and says, man, I... Until I saw your Facebook book, I, I, all of a sudden I realized how wrong my position was, how wrong my candidate was, how wrong the way I've lived. Now that you shared that, I see the light. Introduce me to this Jesus. Nobody says that. Ever. We shine the light of Jesus when we treat people like he did. When we love sinners. When we welcome the outcast when we serve others, when our words are seasoned with grace. You see, something, something happens when, when we shine a light that is so different from what people are expecting, when it is so loving and so gracious and so winsome and beautiful, they want to know more. Now, Madeline Lingle, she says this, we draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe or by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Church, that's how we shine our light. That, that's how we be the light of the world. That, that light is attractive. It, it draws people in. I know I'm, I'm prejudiced in this, so I just name that. Not fully objective, but I still think I'm right, okay? I think my wife shines like this. The light of Jesus shines so brightly in her that people are just attracted to her. I mean, she has conversations all the time that just blow me away. People ask her questions. People tell her things they would never tell me. And I believe it's because the light of Jesus shines so brightly in her. They're attracted to her and they want to know more. They want to know the, the source of it. And it's not just unbelievers, it's believers too. I mean, I look at her life and... I take notice. That's what it means to be the light of the world. So Jesus made these two statements of truth. He says, you are salt and you are light. And we've talked about some of the implications of those. Obviously, there's lots more. We don't have time. But he also makes two pretty common sense observations that I don't want us to miss. Let's look back. I'm going to read 13 to 15 again. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city sun and a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. I mean, salt without saltiness is, is worthless, right? Light that is covered is not helpful. Hey, you don't need a seminary degree to figure that one out, Right? It's common sense. The purpose of light is to give light. If salt's lost its taste, it's no good. So I think what Jesus is saying here, very simply, is that the church exists for the world. We're here to be salt and light. That's why he hasn't taken us home yet. And I think maybe we just need to think at times differently about the church. We, we exist for the world not for the church. He didn't tell us to keep our light to ourselves. We, some of you who grew up around the church, you know the song, hide it under a bushel. No, that's not the purpose. See, the church is not just an institution. It's not just a place where we come to be encouraged. It's the people of God gathered together and then scattered to go, sent out into the world. Again, he didn't say we're the salt and light of the church. We're the salt and light of the world. And so then in verse 16, he tells us what to do. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Again, I want to take us back to what I said before. Remember, he, he tells us who we are before he tells us what to do. This is the only command in the passage. 
But he's told us who we are, and now he says, this is what you do. Go let your light shine. We're to be like a city set on a hill, giving light to all around us. I mean, this is the reason we exist, to display and to declare the glory of God. That's why we're here. We exist for the world, not for ourselves, for his glory. And that word good in in verse 16, the Greek word, it it has the idea of, of beauty. So you see, we don't just illuminate through our words, but also through beautiful works. Pastor Leon's Crump, he's in Atlanta. He says this, the call of the church is that we would be a people who leverage every gift we have been given, in every sphere we have influence, in every place we are placed, so that we can produce, promote, and see a glimpse of the world as God created it. You see, that's good. I, I, I think it's in everywhere and in everyone calling. It, it happens in our homes. It happens in our neighborhoods. It happens where we work. It happens at the grocery store, in the parks, where we play the restaurants that we eat, and maybe even in the places that we are conditioned to avoid. You know, last Sunday night, uh, Landon and his team, they hosted, hosted a worship night here. And I think what they did that night was to highlight some people in our midst who are actually doing just that. Because in addition to singing together, which was great, we came together and we sang, but then after that we broke up into groups and we we went into three different places and we listened to artists who are creating art in three different areas. Uh, A painter and a a quilt maker and a a songwriter. And none of them are making expressly Christian art. It's not what they're doing. But they are using their talents to engage culture, to, to come into contact with culture and bring beauty to be salt and light in the places that God has put them. And I think that's what he's calling the church to do and to be. Wherever God has you, use your gifts, use your talents to bring, to bring beauty to that sphere of life, to display and to declare his glory. See, the call of the church and his people is to enter into the darkness of our world by by seeking to make it better than we, than we found it. To bring beauty to bear with the people and the places where God has us. And again, why do we do that? We want them to see our good works so they give glory to our Father in heaven. We want people to see a glimpse of the world that God intended. And so, so we hope that when we, when we love like that, when we come in contact like that, that people will see and give glory to God. And maybe they'll say, man, I'm, I'm glad they're here. I've said this before, but I would love for people to say that about us as a church. I want them to see our good works and give glory, not to the journey, but to Jesus. And I think there are pockets where that's happening. Um, I, I think our Hispanic brothers and sisters in the Chesterfield Trailer Park would say they are glad that Los Vecinos is there. They're seeing Jesus on display. They're hearing the gospel there. They're experiencing salt and light from volunteers who are serving there, and it's, it's beautiful. I think the family's being served by T4K, Together for Kids, um, those who are fostering and have adopted, those who are being in the local schools who are receiving food from our bumper bag Sundays. I, I think they would say they're, they're glad that we're here. But I want us to encourage us to keep thinking, thinking about getting outside the comfort of these walls, Again, remember, we're the salt and light of the world, not of the church. So as we go, I just want you to think about just a few few questions. I want you to think about where else could could we be salt and light in our community? Where's the decay and the darkness that God might call us into? And maybe specifically for each of us, where's the darkness where your light could shine? Where's the the decay where your salt could preserve? Maybe a more difficult question, but one we should ponder is just, who are the people and where are the places that that we're prone to avoid being salt and light? Those might just be the places that need us the most. I just want you to consider that as we prepare to pray here. And remember, the call is not, uh, not to be God but just to be present with our words and with our deeds in this specific time and place and people where he's put us. And imagine what God would do. 
Let me just pray to that end. Father, thank you. You're so kind to make a declaration over us before you call us to do anything. We, if we've put our faith and our trust in you, you have made it clear that we are your children. We're secure for eternity, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. And so we are salt and we are light. So Lord, would you help us to be salty? Would you help us to shine our light? And would you help us to do it in a way that, that doesn't draw attention to us, but brings glory to you? That's, that's what we long for. So Lord, where are those places? Where are those places in our life that need salt and light? Would you give us a desire and a willingness to enter in? Lord, I pray you would make us that kind of church for the good of our community and for the glory of your name. That's what we pray. And so we ask you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.